And welcome in everyone to another Lennox on Baseball live stream podcast. Glad you're with us on this what is uh, an off day between games two and three of the World Series. We'll have some random thoughts on the World Series and a little history as well uh, at the end of our Lennox on Baseball live stream podcast. But right now, uh, an absolute pleasure to welcome in Jeff Idelson and Gene Fruth as well. Uh, we're going to talk about their endeavor that they've been involved with now uh, with Grassroots Baseball and grassrootsbaseball.com. Jeff, of course, is the former president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. He's worked with Jean, uh, both in Cooperstown. Jean is a photographer, and we're going to talk about her book, Grassroots Baseball, where legends been as well. Um, both of you, Jeff and Jean, thank you so much for taking a couple of minutes with us. Uh, Jean, I, I sort of start off a lot of my live stream podcasts with this, and I'll have Jeff answer it first, but I'll have you go first. Um, a longtime photographer, and we're going to get into your history uh, and your career, but uh, give us an idea of when you sort of started, uh, when you were introduced to the game of baseball. Uh, so I'm going first. Okay, sorry. Um, I was introduced. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the game of baseball for me was sort of a fringe sport when I was growing up because I grew up in a hockey family in New York. My dad was a diehard Rangers fan. So it was all about hockey and the Rangers specifically in my household. My grandfather was a Mets fan. And then I worked at a restaurant where they were Mets, uh, Mets fans and had season tickets. And I'd get to go to some games uh, with the owners of this restaurant. And, um, and that was like my first introduction was, and I considered myself a Mets fan at that time back in the 80s. Um, and then when uh, fast forward to moving to Northern California and um, raising my son at five years old, I started coaching his rookie ball team and uh, and then little league contacted me and asked me to be uh, a coach for them and i told them that i think i was going to be done at the rookie ball level and call it a day and they were looking for women coaches so i decided to join in um and and help out even though i didn't have a strong baseball background they put me with great coaches who taught me a lot and then pretty much um, i got involved with little league on every level and at the time i was a portrait photographer and i had um, two women partners, and we did all black and white film and very artistic, fun um, portraits. Uh, and um, but I really wasn't my passion. It was I was still trying to figure out what my photography path was going to be. And as I delved into sports and delved into baseball in particular, um, I just had a love for it. And the local newspapers called me and asked if I wanted to shoot college and high school sports for them. And I started shooting all sports, football. Um, baseball, of course, and everything else on the docket, and just absolutely loved it. And then um, had an opportunity to start shooting uh, professional sports with the Oakland A's and San Francisco Giants and San Francisco 49ers. So it was a fun path for me, but baseball did always remain the love because of the deep history of the game and, and also the grassroots of the game, which is where I started. Jeff, in your bio, you say you retired as a player in Little League at the age of 12. So your your introduction to the game became well before that, yes? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, my, my introduction to the game came on the radio, and I loved listening to games in the 70s growing up in Boston, Steve, and was really a radio guy. And uh, yeah, I remember just like my dad teaching me to how to keep score. He brought home uh, one of those uh, legal-sized yellow pads from work and developed my own scorecard. And uh, that was my foray was like really following the game on radio and scoring in bed as I listened to my beloved Red Sox back in the, you know, the seventies and the uh, little league was great. And having that opportunity to play was wonderful, but uh, I don't know that I retired as much as I was retired, maybe kind of like a horse, you know, that's had its day. And at age 12, the, the, the folks thought that, you know, you'd be better off trying to help the game in different way than other than playing it. <laughs> So, and you certainly did over the course of your wonderful career. Um, I had originally reached out to Jeff. Uh, he stepped aside. Would you say retired as the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, in August of last year after the ceremonies? I think that's what they call it when People you've been somewhere don't... for a long time. <laughs> okay. But yeah, no, so, I, 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 as I was... Sorry. 
So as I was reaching out to Jeff uh, in the last handful of weeks and, and started up this live stream podcast and just talking with different people uh, within the game and Jeff's story, uh, Jeff, Gene uh, shared what you guys have been uh, have embarked on. Um, and he was nice enough. And I, I get in trouble a couple of times, but I come with props. And this is the book um, that came out in 2019 from Gene, the Grassroots Baseball Where Legends Begin. It's available on the grassrootsbaseball.com website. It's also available uh, in bookstores that some of us can go to now, some of us cannot, uh, but it's also available on Amazon. Um, as you guys started putting the Grassroots Baseball program together, what were some of the things that right off the bat you wanted to uh, incorporate from day one? Gene, we'll have you start off. Um, you know, the big... Uh when we did Grassroots Baseball Where Legends Begin, the book, um, you know, the idea came to expand it beyond a book and 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 just the the need out there. I mean, there's so many great young athletes, you know, in the United States and outside the United States, and so many of them don't have an opportunity uh, to play the game just uh, really because of, of lack of funds. You know, baseball is an expensive game and um, the travel ball and equipment and private lessons and things that are wonderful that some uh, young players get to have. Um, a lot of players don't um, have that opportunity. They don't have the opportunity to even get a, a, a baseball glove to get them started. And there's a, there's a big need out there. And um, Major League Baseball, I know, has jumped in with play ball. And there's just, there's so much um, that can be done for young players to have an opportunity um, to play the sport and it's about celebrating the sport and it's about giving more young players the opportunity um, to be introduced to the sport and um, whether they play that sport or another sport you know as we know uh, kids who play sports have better outcomes in school and, and in life um, and it, it's a healthier choice so um, we're only two people but we have uh, lots of, of support and sponsors and um, and we got a really good start at introducing the game to a lot of young players who had never um, thought about playing before. Jeff, part of the mission to promote and celebrate, and I'm reading here, the amateur game around the globe with a focus on growing interest and participation at the youngest levels. Uh, do want to get into internationally, but within the U.S. right now, how would you classify baseball at that grassroots level? Is it is there a tremendous need, or is it sort of – it stays consistent because I've talked with Steve Keener with Little League. You know, they can always say, you know, we know numbers and numbers sometimes can lie uh, in terms of participation. But as you guys have gotten out there with this program, what are you seeing in terms of participation? Well, what we found, we launched last year, Steve, along uh, Historic Route 66. When we when we developed the grassroots baseball program, we had to figure out where we wanted to launch. And uh, Gene had the brilliant idea of tying the game back to Americana. So, you know, we're in America's heartland, starting in Chicago and making our way across through, uh, you know, Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona and California. And what we learned is that the game is strong at the grassroots level. It needs help. It needs help in growing, which is why we have the grow back, uh, the, the give back program and working and are working in underprivileged communities. But what we're seeing is that volunteerism is strong in these small forgotten towns dotted across the United States. Uh, the game thrives on the youngest levels. And uh, whether you're in uh, Baxter Springs, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma City, uh, Albuquerque, uh, Amarillo, we're finding that the game has strength and that the um, volunteers and those that want to see the game succeed and have kids have that opportunity continue to step up. I think you're muted, Steve. I didn't hear anything. Yeah, that's the producer side of me. I apologize for that. Um, have you been approached? I mean, as you guys have sort of started putting this together and building that foundation in 2020 has been a little bit different. Have you been approached by... Major League Baseball by entities where they want to be a part of this and, uh, you know, and, and can provide support in different ways? We're find, finding that the interest is, is very strong. Uh, you know, the Hall of Famers and legends who stepped up last year sort of gave us that uh, 
that, that extra stamp of approval, if you will. So, you know, when we go, when you walk into a community such as uh, Williams, Arizona with Billy Hatcher, who grew up there, who's telling the story of what it was like to grow up in Williams. And if I can do this, you can do this or Trevor Hoffman and, and Amarillo or George Brett, who grew up not far from Route 66 in El Sangudno when we were in Englewood, Jim Tomey in Illinois, Goose Gossage, our national spokesman, their, their stories resonate with the kids. And uh, as, as uh, our sponsors last year, we had uh, Rawlings step up and Marriott, the Padres, the Diamondbacks. We had great support last year. And uh, I, the appreciation for what we're doing is felt, I think, throughout the baseball community. Grassrootsbaseball.com is the website that we encourage you to visit. Um, Gene's book, again, I'll bring it back into focus here. Gene, you mentioned in the beginning uh, when I asked you about, you know, sort of being introduced to baseball. How is shooting baseball photography different than anything else that you've done in your career? It, the baseball, well, especially for the grassroots work, but also Major League Baseball as well. You know, I shoot Major League Baseball during the season. Um, and I'm also jumping back and forth between grassroots and Major League Baseball, which is uh, a fun combination. But there's just so much more storytelling to be done in baseball. So much happens off the field. And there's just all the, it's the connecting of generations. It's moms on the sidelines, you know, and and all the all of the people who make up the fabric of the game that really um, I love to document. I love documenting action. Action's exhilarating. And um, of course, I do that on a regular basis. Um, but there is so much more storytelling in baseball um, that can be done for a photographer. And that's what makes it interesting. And that's what you get uh, so much more interest, really, even outside the baseball world in photography when, when, you, when you tell the story. You tell the stories of all those old stadiums across the country and around the world. And and uh, the stories of, of, the, um, of the families and also the, the families where the dad played, the uncle played, the son played, the grandfather played, and, um, and they know their baseball history. And uh, it's, it's just terrific. It's, uh, I'm excited every day to do it. <laughs> Gene, when you coached at Little League, and, and I've since stepped away from our local Little League program that I was a part of here in Connecticut, uh, where we're based out of, uh, my younger son retired uh, even before Jeff did at 12. He retired <laughs> at about nine. The oldest is still playing. But, you know, I always told the kids at the end of practices, hey, there are games on TV. You can watch them on your parents' phone. You can watch them on your phone. You can do a lot of different things. In terms of, you know, Kids are digesting things differently. We know that now. But in terms of watching the game, you know, uh, you know, and we do. We talk about watching at the major league level. But even being able to watch older kids, whether it's you know their older, you know, their friends in little league or anything like that, are those? Was that a focal point in terms of encouraging them to to watch the game so they could you know learn? Because I feel like that's almost a missed part now with youngsters. Yeah, it's a really good point. Kids are definitely getting their content in a different way. You know, um, my son, who's 23 and just finishing up school, you know, he seems to know every player who's out there. Yet, you know, watching a whole baseball game, you know, I can't get him to sit still to watch a whole game with me. But somehow he's getting the content and he's and he knows the players. So he must be watching replays or whatever he has. He has every app on his phone and. <laughs> and he's kind of dialed in. He can throw, you know, what somebody's baseball stats are much faster than I can off the top of his head. So I think they get the content in their own way. I think the attention span of this generation, because of how fast everything moves and how content is so spread out in so many different ways. And I mean, even when you try to get a message, people message you on Instagram, Facebook. You know, there's like so many like places you need to check just to see if you missed a message. Um, so I, I think that the interest is still there. Um, they do watch their heroes. I was just shooting uh, in Texas two days ago, and uh, they, it was a practice, um, and the, the kids were backhanding, and they said, uh, Jeter it, Jeter it. And I said, well, if they're saying Jeter it, you know, that's their hero, you know, and I just thought it was great that they yelled out Jeter it, and, and they know their players, you know, and so, you know, their, their heroes are still there and still still out there. You know, they, they may not know the older guys and they may say, you know, mantle who, but uh, you know, the <laughs> poppers and, and uh, current players, they're, they're mimicking them on the college level. 
they're dressing like them, their hairstyles are like them, and you know they're playing the game. They they know batting stances, and I saw a, a college I was shooting at, and they can mimic every batting stance of of all their their favorite players. So so they're paying attention. Jeff, uh, I imagine when Gene said, you know, they don't know mantle, I sort of cringed a little bit, and maybe you did the same. Uh, similar to you in terms of context of seeing young people and how they take in the game now. Uh, what have you What have you sort of encountered during your time in the last couple of, uh, in the last uh, since you got this underway? Very similar to Gene, uh, and that these kids still do know and are dialed into the game, which is important. I mean, you know, we, we were with about six kids in Texas. And I asked each of them why they wore the number they wore. And, you know, one kid was like, yeah, I'm wearing two because of Jeter. And, you know, you still see a lot of that. And, uh, you know, what we're also finding are the volunteers and, and, and the, uh, those who are administrators, you know, are encouraging these kids to look up to these players, to find out, to, to, to find and study and understand some of the, uh, in the majors today to, uh, pick guys, uh, pick guys that are strong players, but also good in character. And, uh, you see that, especially in the smaller towns, really quite poignantly. How do you go about, I mean, it, it, is it important in terms, you mentioned, you know, they know the names, George Brett, Rich Gossage, uh, the different guys that you've had as part of the program. Um, but how important is it to pass on that history where they do know beyond Derek Jeter in the next decade uh, and they can go back to the 70s, 60s and, and, and before that? I think it's really important, uh, Steve. I mean, and I think that uh, parents can help. It helps put things into context about what the, you know, what the social situation was like in the country at that time and how a player may have succeeded or, uh, you know, had trouble succeeding in light of what was going on and, and how the conditions on fields changed. So it's great in terms of relaying context that, uh, you know, the well-manicured fields that these guys play on today didn't exist in the 70s. I mean, if you want to – if you went to a game in the 70s or 80s, you, know, you take a look at the pictures and the, the, the fields are not manicured remotely like they are today. So, you know, it kind of gives kids an opportunity to see that uh, not only were players, uh, you know, maybe dressed differently, but they also experienced different conditions than they do today. Ask both of you the same question. We'll start with you, um, Jeff. Uh, when people, you know, there are a lot of detractors and, and it drives me crazy listening to radio hosts, especially where, you know, it's LeBron James basketball, it's football and what are the Cowboys doing? Um, and then they get that one segment in their three or four hour show where, you know, they're going to talk baseball this time of the year where, you know, baseball's gotten through a shortened regular season. Baseball's gotten through uh, the postseason to this point. And we've got the World Series two games in now and uh, we will have a conclusion to the 2020 baseball season. When you hear the negativity and, and you know, the, like I said, you know, tying it into those hosts who are only going to have that one segment, a three hour show where they're just going to take the time to bash something that I truly don't think most understand in terms of the game present today. When you hear those conversations, what sort of comes up in your brain of, you know, the pre the game, the way it is presented uh, present day? I, I feel like they're missing something because, I mean, you know, before 2020, you know, you can argue that football on uh, 16 or 18 Sundays is, is, is incredibly popular. Uh, auto racing with 100,000 fans showing up for a race is big. But, you know, baseball is still very much the national pastime. And you look at uh, 77 million fans who went to major league games, 43 million fans who went to minor league games, baseball's on, uh, on the calendar seven months of the year. Uh, it's hard to argue that baseball's still not the national pastime. And yeah, for instance, you, you look in the state of Oklahoma, and I learned this last week, they have, uh, the schools have the opportunity of having two baseball seasons, spring and fall. And if they pick the fall, it's at the expense of football. So, you know, baseball continues to have a strong foothold in America. It's just not uh, instantaneous, instant, instant gratification as other sports deliver. Gene, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be great if the media could give more attention to baseball. And I think it's important to a lot of people. I think that the, the, the audience is out there if they give it the time because, you know, all you need to do is drive across this country and you'll, you know, you just see how important it is throughout the generations, including this generation. And if they have more interest stories that they could bring up, I mean, that's a lot of what you see with basketball is the behind the scenes. And 
I think that's interesting to people. And when you see certain, you know, media outlets doing behind the scenes of baseball, it gets a lot of interest. So I, I believe, you know, it's out there strong. And um, if more attention was put on it, I, I think they would get great results. In terms of the program that you guys continue to build on um, in the short amount of time, what's the best compliment that you've gotten about your endeavor? Well, um, I, I, I think just the reaction we're getting from the kids has been really, really important. And uh, I guess the Hall of Famers, too. I know it's really a coin flip, but, uh, you know, the, the, the Hall of Famers and other Route 66 legends, Steve, who we asked to come join us last year at 10 stops, 10 stops across America, all of these guys said yes without without even hesitating about coming and, and, and supporting our clinics. They didn't take any pay. Uh, they did this because of their uh, love for the game and not forgetting their grassroots experiences themselves. And to have the Hall of Famers not only come in, but uh, deliver resounding messages and, and do so with great pride shows you that uh, they've never forgotten. And, that, and to me, that's a ringing endorsement of our program and that we're doing the right thing. You know, echoing what, echoing what Jeff said, you know, the Hall of Famers, I mean, just this morning, Johnny Bench retweeted a, a blog that Jeff wrote uh, about Baxter Springs baseball and about a, a volunteer who's been there for 50 years. And when I saw Johnny Bench retweet that, he did because he gets it, you know, a the small town that he came from, not too far from Baxter Springs. And and he knows what, what's happening out there, you know, across the country in those small towns. And he understands grassroots baseball and that's what he lived and he supports it. So anytime, like it, it, is, it is a big compliment when, um, when those guys, you know, see it and get it and support it. And probably for me as a photographer, um, you know, I'm always trying to show how baseball looks different in different places and telling the stories of baseball across the country. And in one particular, uh, well, there's a chapter on Mobile, Alabama, where five Hall of Famers, as you know, um, are from. Uh, uh, I did a, a photograph of high school players um, at Hank Aaron's house, childhood home that is now a museum. Yeah. And I posed them uh, all full uniform. Um, on his house, we left the rocking chair on the porch, uh, Hank's rocking chair empty in respect um, to Hank Aaron. And uh, it was just a really important chapter for me to tell the story of what's happening today in Mobile, Alabama and telling it back to history. And when Hank Aaron looked through the chapter of the book, when, when the book was finished, um, he said, wow, this is really Mobile. And uh, to me, that's the highest compliment if I do nothing else. You know, it's uh, that's the story that I want to tell, and if it comes from Hank Aaron, I'm 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 done. <laughs> that's terrific. Uh, I appreciate that share there. Um, in terms of when when you've gone out and seen kids, and you know, we do we know that you know just about every sport now um, is expensive because you know, I found that you know if if my son's friend or or their friends have you know this particular piece of equipment, then you know, they need to go out and get that, uh, you know, shin guard or uh, armband, uh, the, the different things, uh, the different bags that are now available. Uh, not one bat, but two bats in the bat bag. As you've gone out there with the kids and, and, and seen what they bring, especially in the uh, underprivileged areas that you guys have gone to across your uh, tracks in 2019, in terms of the equipment, how do you, how does it sort of build that where you know you go into these communities and you ha and they have exactly what they need? Well, um, thinking back last year, we were so lucky to have the Padres and Diamondbacks uh, help sponsorship, which allowed us to work with Rawlings, Big League Chew, but uh, Gum, but to go into these communities, Steve, and present every child or have the Hall of Famer or legend present every child with a, a brand new glove in baseball. And, you know, you talk about the, the equipment bag, the bats, the instep guard, the elbow guard. These kids don't even have gloves. And for these kids to then get their first glove, they have an opportunity to use a glove to play catch with Goose Gossage. And then at the end of the day, to, 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 to have the understanding they get to keep the glove uh, was really powerful. And it's a start. And really all you need is – is a glove and a, all you need is a glove and a ball to get going in a bat. And uh, we've uh, felt we feel very good that we've at least provided the basics then for these kids to then get to the next level.
And there we go. I'm back now. Gene, similar uh, in terms of what you've encountered? You know, I, I also, to add to that, though, uh, you know, just as we travel to places, and as I travel to, I mean, all you need to do, go, do is go go to a field in the Dominican Republic and see a training facility there and see what those players are working with and more so what they're not, what they don't have. And the grit and de the determination is there, and not only in the Dominican Republic, but really through, you know, Mobile, Alabama. I would photograph one high school that, you know, couldn't even afford jerseys, and they were fundraising for that, and their field was 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 a mess, and they had no equipment. They certainly didn't have a bag with two bats in it, and they only had the the, the high school equipment to work with. But grit, determination, you know incredible athletes you know the talent is there and the determination is there and there's tough kids out there and there's a lot to be said for you know a kid raised in that way having that adversity to overcome and who they become and all you need to, you see it on the major league level all the time all the kids coming from the Dominican Republic and their stories are not much different than Vladimir Guerrero's or uh, you know Juan Marichal certainly that's a different era but Vladdy's, you know, I mean, the way he grew up in John Gregorio and what he had and certainly what he didn't have didn't stop him from his journey. And you see it every day and kids from Cuba, but you also see it here in the United States, you know, in these small towns and uh, with, you know, good family around them and good values. You know, you're, you're seeing strong baseball out there, even without having the, the fanciest of equipment. And it's sort of a transition there to talk about the program internationally. What has been most eye-opening um, as you guys have, have gone to different countries that uh, that really look at baseball in a different way? You want to take that, Gene? Well, I mean, for me, it's um, there's so much real life in, in places like the Dominican Republic, like Cuba, I mean, even the time we've spent in, you know, in Puerto Rico in smaller towns and, uh, you know, besides baseball, they have real life, serious, you know, issues and adversity to uh, overcome besides their baseball. And, you know, throughout it all, I really think you just see this grit and de de determination places like the Dominican Republic that I've been going to for years, you know, there's kids who are playing baseball from such a young age with, you know, the hope of being able to support their entire extended family if they can make it, you know, to the U.S. and get a contract. So, uh, you know, it takes on a seriousness for sure. Um, the, the great thing that you see, you know, is, is this the purity uh, at the young level for just the love of the game, you know, and they they don't compare their field to another field. They're, it's just their field. They don't know anything else, nor do they care. They just, it's just this absolute pure love for the game. And you see them run on the field with the biggest smile. And it's also a way to, you know, a, a diversion and, and some joy in life of, uh, you know, that's, that's what it's about, you know, with, with, a, with a tough life, you know, all around family life, it's, um, Baseball definitely brings joy, even if it doesn't go to any kind of professional level, and um, and certainly a healthy choice. You touched on Latin America there. How about from uh, your trips to Asia, uh, to Japan, um, and and what you've encountered at the, at the lower levels, at the youth level? Yeah, well, I mean, J Japan is a, it's a whole different ball game, and uh, you know, it, I think that uh, really shows in in Gene's book, Grassroots Baseball, where legends begin. We, you know, to to, to you know, it was great because uh, Gene and I were both in Japan and Tokyo for the World Baseball Classic, and it's a great story. I said, you know, what what are you doing today? Oh, I'm going to go peel off and go to you know Little League, and I said, oh, can I go along? And it was the opening ceremonies, and to see the seriousness with which it's taken in Tokyo. There must have been 12 or 1300 players and families in the stadium, ceremonies, uh, the, the presentations of trophy from the year before, the respect uh, for the game from the uniform. Every kid is lined up and, and doing calisthenics. And then to go to a game, uh, and it's a great story that Gene can tell, but the, to go to a game and just see how they how it's approached, how batting practice is taken, how the, how the players – present the lineup cards as opposed to the coaches, how they bow to the umpires. It is a very different game than in the United States in terms of the uh, 
regalness in which it's played. But at the end of the day, these are still kids playing baseball. Yeah, my experience in Japan was just, I, I love seeing, I mean, talking about baseball looks different in different places. Like, wow, it sure looks different there. And had the opportunity to shoot at the Koshian Stadium and even just the, the, the soil, the, the um, ball girls, the, the vendors in the stands, the, the fans, the, the balloons in the seventh inning. And all, I mean, there's just so much around the game that looks different and is so... Um, well, it's unique to, to, to Japan, and um, uh, the great story of, of that day of shooting uh, uh, the opening day of Little League was it was just random what game uh, I got to choose to, to, to shoot, and in all honesty, I chose the one closest to my hotel because I had the World Baseball Classic that night. So that's what that was. That was how my decision making went into play for that, you know. And I didn't know any of the teams, so that's the game I went to. Shot that game, and fast forward to I'm in Williamsport for the Little League World Series, and it's the parade, the opening day of Williamsport, and I'm walking down Main Street before the parade starts, just deciding what's my background going to be for when the parade starts. And I keep hearing my name, or I think I am hearing my name, but there's a lot of crowd noise, and I'm not sure. So I keep walking, saying, why would I hear my name here? And then sure enough, I hear it again, and I turn around, and there's a whole stand of Japanese fans waving at me. And I'm like, what's happening right now? Like, why could – and I'm turning around to see if it's somebody behind me so I don't make a fool of myself. And I walk over, and it's those parents from that opening day of Little League back in March. And I, what are you doing here? They said, we made it. Our team is in the <laughs> World Series. And so I photographed their very first day of Little League, and then their very last day, and they ended up winning the Little League <laughs> World Series. So I literally got them from day one to the very final day, and they made it all the way to Williamsport just because it was closest to my hotel. And it was so... That's so fantastic to be able to celebrate with these parents and you know and and see them again after seeing them uh, their very first day in Tokyo. So, you know, just before we went on, and, and Jeff, you went from college to the Red Sox to the Yankees, um, and then uh, ultimately ended up in Cooperstown, New York, as the president. You know, working there uh, and then becoming the president for eleven years of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, just before we all connected here, uh, I saw on. Twitter Twitter. It's the anniversary of Clemens and uh, the Subway Series in 2000. And not to make this about me, but uh, at the time I was working for the Yankees affiliate in Staten Island. So I was able to talk to Rick Cerrone and uh, Jason Zillow and say, you know, hey, you know, can I be a runner? Can I do anything, for, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the media relations department for the playoffs in the World Series? And uh, when I approach them on it, I, little did I know that, you know, the Subway Series would, would happen and be the Mets and Yankees. But as you guys are sharing these stories, it's, you know, just in terms of your careers, you know, the highlights that baseball has given all three of us. I mean, there's just a common uh, commonality there. Um, and Jeff, just, you know, in, in terms of the stories over the course of your career of, you know, just to be able to sit back every once in a while and just say, wow, this game is, you know, allowed me to go all over the world and present it uh, the way I know best. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the, what I love about baseball and why I ended up in Cooperstown was because of its connection to American culture and, and people. And I love being at the team level. I love the, the, the daily grind of being with the Red Sox and Yankees and being on the road. Um, but, you know, coming to Cooperstown allowed the allowed me to experience and enjoy the tie-in with culture and history and the great moments. So whether it was the the great home run chase in 98, which we now know the backdrop on with steroids, but at that time, what it meant to baseball uh, as, a, as a comeback to, uh, you know, that the, uh, the, World, the World Series after 9-11, which was second to none with Luis Gonzalez, somehow miraculously winning that with a broken bat single off of the great, one of the great closers of all time, Mariano Rivera, to having to seeing the intersection of baseball and American culture with people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg or, or President Obama, who came to Cooperstown and having really the opportunity to see how baseball affects the different aspects of community and culture to me was incredibly rewarding. And I feel very, very fortunate to have had that opportunity and continue to do so with grassroots baseball. 
Gene, the story about uh, the Japanese parents from opening day to Williamsport, uh, I think you can top it, but just in terms of your career and what, you know, what has opened up doors for you, could you share a couple more? Just, uh, you know, certainly shooting with the, with the Hall of Fame and having the experience, um, uh, the experiences that I've had um, as they're traveling photographer and then beyond, you know, with La Vida Baseball and traveling the world and being able to see the differences in culture and, um, I went to Puerto Rico a few years ago to do um, a, a photo essay on Roberto Clemente, and it was going to be documenting everything Roberto Clemente. This is probably more than a few years ago now that I think about it, boy, time flies. But um, so I, I went there uh, with the thought of documenting where he went to school, where he went to church, where he got married, all, you know, just everything, where he first played baseball, of course. And um, through the Hall of Fame, I also got connected with uh, Vera Clemente and uh, we were gonna get together and have lunch so I could ask her where else I might go and, and get some background um, from her. And she still, at the time, lived in the house where she raised her sons and with Roberto. And uh, instead she invited me over to the house um, for lunch and uh, I wasn't photographing, my cameras were with me, but it was just uh, sitting down and getting to know each other. And it was an incredible uh, experience to be with her. And, you know, before I knew it, she was inviting me and she told me that on the eve um, of Roberto's death, they throw out flowers at the at the crash site. And I was asking her if I could photograph there. And I, I did go to try to find it myself. And I had a hard time because there's no markers. And she said uh, she agreed to let me come and, and photograph her and her family um, and it was at that time it was happening, you know, on New Year's, New Year's Eve. Um, and I went with them, the entire family, um, to the crash site, photographed Vera throwing in flowers into, into the ocean at the site. Um, the whole family held hands and, and told a prayer and uh, said a prayer. And they asked me to join and put my cameras down to say the prayer with them. And, you know, this is just beyond photography at that point. It's an experience and hearing their stories of their father and of her hus late husband. Um, that's just an incredible memory. And then inviting me back to the house to photograph all these amazing art uh, artifacts that were just in their basement that they took up in a big Tupperware container. And like, oh, here's the jersey of the 3000 hit. You know, do you want to try it on? I said, I absolutely do not try it on but I would love to photograph it and then I'm setting up the studio in her kitchen with chairs and trying to find a background and they're getting me sheets and one of the sons got a, a mechanic light for me so I could light it properly well not properly but light it the way I could light it <laughs> um, and uh, there's this there was just absolutely nothing like that and um, and we just you know and I kept saying hey it's the holidays I should go and leave you be and they said if you leave try to leave we'll lock the door you're our, you're our family now you're <laughs> it was uh you know i'm forever grateful for for memories like that and it's just uh, very special to me so yeah thank you to the holiday thank you thank you baseball Thank you for sharing that as well. Um, getting back into, you know, from the perspective of 2020, uh, everything's been put on hold or we've had to, you know, call audibles at the, at the you know, at every moment uh, of, of our daily lives, of our weekly lives. Um, from the program standpoint, what have you been able to do in 2020? What have you had to put on hold for the future? We'll start with Jeff. Uh, well, obviously, with COVID, it slowed everything down, and in a lot of in a lot of ways, stopped stopped uh, for a while what we were able to do. And you know, clinics have had to go on the back uh, on the back burner for now, unfortunately. But uh, we were able to ho hold one clinic in February in Puerto Rico uh, with Yvonne Rodriguez, uh, which was great at the Boys and Girls Club in Santorce. Uh, in fact, a, a Boys and Girls Club that Orlando Cepeda's sister worked at for many years. So we had one great clinic in Puerto Rico and had planned to have many more down there this year. And obviously those have had to be tabled. We uh, have been able to safely find some pockets of, of baseball where it's being played. Uh, uh, you know, as Gene mentioned, we were in Amarillo, Texas and uh, able to photograph there and spend some time there and in some, and in some other communities as well as we uh, 
build towards uh, continuing the program and, and working on uh, a second book. Yeah, I was also uh, shooting the major league game and some of the playoffs this season and to document just, uh, just all of the, I mean, between cardboard cutouts, you know, no fans in the stands, social injustice, um, uh, displays and um, everything that the players were going through and then fires right in my backyard of San Francisco, poor air quality and fires in the sky while baseball was being played. And, you know, looking back on, on this, uh, this, this body of work for 2020 in the major league level is just, I mean, like no other, it's, uh, it certainly tells uh, a very interesting story, uh, you know, now looking at the body of work and the pictures. Um, so I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to, to shoot that. And the grassroots level, yeah, it, it all slowed down, but it's, it's still happening. And slowing down sometimes is not a bad thing. Um, we the new book that's coming out, Grassroots Baseball Route 66, is going to be better because of it. You know, the one thing I don't have is probably a lot of patience, um, and so I'm always moving faster, trying to get it done, and that doesn't always make the best product. So this forced uh, us, me in particular. Jeff is a much more patient person and thorough person. <laughs> I move too fast. Uh, so it's it made everything slow down, and uh, it's going to make the pictures better and the project better because it's forcing more seasons across more seasons, and that's only going to make a better product. And it also gave us a chance to reflect, get the program ready when we're getting back out there, which has been terrific to, to do some things that we wouldn't have had the time to do. And we also got almost all the writing done for the Legends for Route 66, and everybody was sitting at home. and. Um, so getting everybody's attention is for the last book was much harder, you know. Trying to get a, a, a an essay out of Ricky Henderson when he's doing <laughs> the same thing, you know, and he probably has less patience than me. And so uh, this was a good time to have everybody tell their stories of what it was like growing up along Route 66. People had the time to do it, and we got a better product because of it. And so, and the same thing with the pictures. So. I'll go back out for another season. That's only going to make it better and um, just hope for the world to get better and um, see kids and seeing everybody get back out there safely would be just terrific. So is there a published date for the second book? Well, I have a date in my mind. Well, first of all, yeah, we, I mean, I, I always have to have a deadline. Uh, that's just okay. me. <laughs> but I think we'll have all the shooting done uh, by early spring have it edited and it'll certainly be able to be a Christmas present for 2021. So it'll be out before the end of 2021. How's that, Jeff? There we go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Breaking news for Jeff right there. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I appreciate you both doing this. Uh, I would kick myself if we, if I said goodbye and I didn't uh, ask Jeff this because um, Jeff, I, I shared this with you in an email. Um, goosebumps and, and just thinking about it all the times you were able to make the announcement of the hall of fame classes and the way you did it um how did that sort of build for you over the years and was there a comp level that you reached that maybe you didn't have in the early years when you made the announcements of each year's hall of fame class absolutely steve i mean and think about how you you know how you call action and you think about who your audience is who you're talking to and I don't have the experience of having spent time on television or radio in a meaningful way. So at first it was like, okay, I just got to get the information out. But then you realize you're talking to these players because they're hearing it for the first, the, really the very, the first time or second time they get the call saying they're in, but here I am on television and I have this opportunity to speak to a player and his family and the audience and to realize that it's a really significant moment for them. I mean, this is the culmination, the, the absolute culmination peak of their career if they make the Hall of Fame. So yeah, I try to keep that in mind and, and, and understand the audience and think about the audience. And if they were uh, 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 players from Spanish speaking countries, Latinos, I tried to work some Spanish in and I, I, I don't, I, I didn't speak Spanish. I, when I got into seventh grade, you know, they said, you have to take French or Spanish. So I went home and asked my mom, what do I take? And she says, oh, you have to take French. It's the romantic language. So, you know, seven years later, I learned French and 
And, you know, the only the only people I can speak to are the expos and then they fold. So I have no one to talk to. So, you know, the idea was to just get some Spanish in there so that you're actually communicating on a much more personal level with those who are getting in uh, of Latino uh, heritage. And uh, that's what I tried to do moving forward. Jeff Idelson, Gene Fruth, thank you so much. Uh, wish you all the best going forward. Looking forward to tracking the progress and the success of the grassroots baseball program. But uh, again, much appreciation for you both, to you both, uh, for taking the time with me today. Oh, thanks so much. This was great. I appreciate you having us on. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Great to be on Lennox on Baseball. Enjoy the day, both of you, and uh, hopefully we can catch up down the road. I, I love your logo, by the way. It's really, it's great. Well, we'll keep going here then. Thank you. Uh, you know what? Uh, I don't have it with me here. Um, I will. I the last person I had on was former uh, big leaguer and Texas Longhorn Dennis Cook, and I had a real bad connection. And at the end of that, uh, it, I, I I will send an email and ask for both of your addresses. Uh, and what I'm going to do is you're going to be the first two. And, and it's a real privilege to be able to do this. Uh, the quality my wife loves. So I got it signed off on, but I'm going to send you both. I put the logo on a hat. I'm looking to do more of that stuff. So I will ask for both of your addresses uh, where you're based out of. And uh, I will. you're, you're going to be the first two where I send hats to. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's great. Steve, Steve, I know like all of us, probably at some level when you were a kid, you wanted to be a GM. So we'll, we'll trade you a grassroots baseball cap for those caps. Outstanding. Thank you so much, <laughs> both of you again. See you, Steve. Gene Fruth and Jeff Idelson. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And I always preface it by saying um, – in terms of, you know, oh, that was that was a lot of fun to do. That truly was. And it's not taking away from any of the other live stream podcast guests that we've had uh, with Lennox on Baseball. But Gene just made my day right there. Uh, we do have the Lennox on Baseball cap. Uh, they're giveaways right now. Uh, they're not for sale. They're, they're giveaways. And uh, we'll be putting that together. So I uh, wanted to close with a couple of random thoughts. And Jeff and Gene were both terrific. Uh, the book grassroots baseball where legends begin and gene said you know the second book uh with the route 66 legends will be coming out this is absolutely a must in terms of if you have a baseball fan a hanukkah gift a holiday gift a christmas gift for 2020 this is truly amazing and i shared with gene uh before we went on that there's been a handful of times where you know i get home from work uh, it'll be 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, the stresses or whatever, I can get rid of those in the car. I can sort of have some downtime. Uh, but I've come home. There's a light upstairs before I go into the bedroom, before, you know, I put myself to bed for the night finally. I I found myself just on the couch, 1.30, 2.30 in the morning, just going through this amazing book by Gene Fruth. And absolutely, I'm trying to get it. Uh, there we go, as best I can. Uh, this is absolutely uh, a must if you have a baseball fan, whether it's your husband, whether it's your wife, whether it's a child, uh, whether it's a grandparent, anything like that. Grassrootsbaseball.com is where you can buy it. You can also buy it on Amazon. You can purchase it uh, in bookstores as well. But uh, thank you to Gene and Jeff for joining us. Uh, this is an anniversary. 20 years ago tonight, it was a Sunday. And I saw it, and I mentioned it to Jeff and Gene when I was on. Um, I saw it uh, on Twitter, the video of the Clemens and Piazza at bat in game two of the World Series in 2000, the Subway Series. And I was out in the right field auxiliary box at Yankee Stadium. I don't call it the old Yankee Stadium. It was Yankee Stadium. And uh, it was a runner going back and forth. And I've actually talked uh, and had some stories uh, that I've shared when uh, Dom Amori um, and John Altavilla were guests with me on our Lennox on Baseball live stream podcast about uh, the late Bob Shepard. But out there in the right field auxiliary press box, out behind the right field uh, foul pole, and you know, wondering what's going on. Is everyone standing up and you're watching the monitors? And Clemens throws the bat into the ground, and Mouse, I thought it was the ball, I thought it was the ball, and Piazza starts to make his way out there. Um, but I thought of this this morning, and, and Dom actually – uh, you can follow Don Memori on Twitter. He just did a story, another story on Bobby Valentine that I haven't read yet. Um, but 
part of the post game was taking um, the transcripts from the interviews in the interview room and, and handing them out to writers uh, in the press room downstairs at Yankee Stadium off from the clubhouses and stuff. And so I'm standing in the doorway listening to Piazza post game, and all of a sudden Bobby Valentine is standing right next to me. And I got a chance to meet Bobby Valentine a handful of years later when I was in Japan for the World Baseball Classic. Uh, but he's just, he wanted to hear what Piazza had to say in that moment as well. And he kind of, you know, made mention of like, I can't believe he just said that. And I can't quote him verbatim all these years later, 20 years to the date later. Um, but he was, he was kind of surprised at Piazza's thoughts on the whole thing. Um, and the incident involving Clemens where he threw the shattered bat. But you take a look at that. Uh, you know, that pitch is coming up and in, and he fought it off, and the bat splinters, and the barrel ends up going out towards um, the pitcher's mound, and then you know Clemens ends up firing it into the ground. And just imagine what would have happened if that actually hit Piazza, because at that point in time, you've got suspensions, um, because Piazza, I'm sure, goes after him rather than walking towards him. He's going after him at that point in time, especially based on their history. So our thanks to Jeff Idelson and Gene Fruth. They were terrific today. Uh, we did have a little bit of a lull between our last uh, Lennox on Baseball live stream podcast with Dennis Cook. Had some technical difficulties when you've got four different people or three different people in the household all taking the internet. I've learned You've got to do this when uh, the kids are actually at school, and that's where they're at today. So I thank Jeff Idelson. I thank Gene Fruth for joining us again. The book, Grassroots Baseball, Where Legends Begin. Uh, the photography by Gene Fruth is just outstanding. Um, it's it's absolutely worth it. Uh, and a terrific Hanukkah or Christmas present. Uh, it's, it's getting there. So we got to start thinking about gift ideas. And that is an absolute must. Uh, it's an absolute great gift idea. It's available on the grassrootsbaseball.com website. I've got a couple of hats to go send out. Uh, so <laughs> we will be doing that. And we will be back tomorrow, and we will continue to build on this as well. Please let your friends know about us. Lennox on Baseball Facebook page, also building up the YouTube channel and available on Twitter with a lot of random thoughts throughout the course of a day, week, month, and all of that. And uh, we will have some thoughts on the World Series in the first two games tomorrow as we continue. For now, enjoy the rest of your day. And as always, we appreciate uh, your support and your checking in with us as well.